volunteers. We got some things to hand out tonight. Dan, looks like you're the first one up. Maybe you need some more. Looks like it should be enough to give everybody one to start with. Everybody should be getting a number two book. Uh, this is your book. If you do not want to take it home, leave it in the pew when we're done. We'll pick it up. But if you want to keep it, stick your name on there. And then everybody should be getting a, a copy of the lesson number two, Back to the Bible, the large print edition. We like the large print because it's easier to read. Also, you're getting a gift from the congregation here. Everybody needs a gift card. How many of y'all like to receive those gift cards? Yeah. So Helen, we know what to get you for holiday gifts, right? Birthday presents, anniversaries. I like the ones that you can eat. Not the card, but the ones you can take and eat, yeah? Not to mention any names, but the one of the gift cards we buy is, and sometimes we get extras for ourselves, that's the uh, Texas Roadhouse. You'll get a you'll get a free appetizer or something. And sometimes you can use the gift cards and people have given them to us. And I always wonder when we hand them the gift card if the waiter or waitresses think, okay, I'm not getting a tip now. But they do. But tonight we're going to be in to treat for some for some tips in relationship to tools for souls. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Before we do so, we're going to go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. And we're going to get Terry, since he's right here. If you would, Terry, lead us in prayer begin. Sick will be mentioned later. If you've got sick, please give that information to Haley. But let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Thank you, Terry. Amen. And we're happy to have you if you're visiting with us tonight. Especially appreciate that. It's good to see the families all together here. I have to look twice to see if, Jared, if you're there or you're here, because y'all are getting to look a lot alike. But we're happy y'all are here. And also, we're happy to have the Howertons over here. Megan and Kyle, is that correct? And We've been kind of in touch throughout Facebook for a while, and it's so nice to see her in person and, and Kyle. Because I think it's Megan that she's friended everybody, right, Megan? Yeah, that's great. Appreciate them being here tonight. Good to see Jerry Letterman back with us. And 
And how's Charlotte? Is she here tonight? Yeah, there's Charlotte. I just, I didn't see her right there. Jared was blocking the way there to Charlotte, so. Hi, Charlotte. We do appreciate having her back with us and the others that have been ill. Tonight we're going to dive in and continue our study of tools for souls. We were going to get in, we're going to get in tonight the video for the second lesson, which I know you'll enjoy and people have commented they really appreciate seeing that. Because it does give us a feel and also a visual of, of how to conduct a simple study with somebody. And that's the design of this video is to show you what a study is like. And one of the things that's interesting about this is people are asking questions. And that causes us to you know, think about, well, can we handle the things that are thrown at us? But when we're talking about a Bible study with somebody, what are we studying? The Bible. We don't have to know an encyclopedia, do we? We don't have to memorize the Britannica encyclopedia set in order to be able to have a Bible study. And most important, we just learn to have access to scriptures, and we don't have to have them all memorized. There's a lot of tools that we can throw in our Bibles that will help us have quick access to scriptures. How many of you do not have one of these Moyer, Moyer books, slide rules? Charlotte's uh, gave us out some and then we ordered more and Randy's had these he doesn't have have these we'll get them passed out make sure you take one of those with you because they're handy access also available as a tool for the scriptures to thoroughly equip us for every good work is the Bible basic Bible references it's good to put these in your Bible they can easily sit there and, and be a part of your page markers bookmarks in in the scriptures Because to be equipped for every good work means we start with all scripture. And those scriptures are able to do what's necessary for us to be thoroughly equipped to have the right tools. Lesson two book right here. Now, we tonight have, as mentioned earlier, we have the gift cards. And we ordered, I think it was 700 of these gift cards, 750 of these gift cards. And so this is the time of year to get these out. And as you look at this gift card, it is a tool. And what it does is it gives a person with their smartphone. In fact, if you want to take out your phones, I know Haley's been, been requesting that we silence them. But if you have the barcode reader on your phone, would you all take it out and scan the barcode and see what you get? And the first one that gets something that looks like something you should have got, then I want you to hold it up. So grab out your phone, scan the barcode. And I was hoping, and I thought we could cut off the top part if you just wanted to stick this in a Christmas card or a holiday card, as we call them, uh, that you send to somebody. But you need to send the whole thing because it has the barcode on it. So they want to get access to the barcode. But even if they don't scan it, what's right here? What's it, if you look at the back side of the card, what do you have right here? You've got the web address. When you go to that web address, what you're going to get is a listing of some awesome videos, including apologetic press videos. You're going, to, you're going to get everything you need to teach somebody the gospel, to answer a lot of questions, and, and, and there's even children's videos on there. I watched three of them today. And so these videos uh, can be great and useful tools. Now, if you'll notice down there, it says contact us. You can write your name and your phone number down there, you and your wife. Or you can also, we have stamps that are available. You can stamp these or you can write it on here. You know, put Church of Christ, put the phone number. Depends on what you're going to do with it. Now, when Charlotte and Leon feel like exercising, they can just go pass this out and stick it on the doors in the neighborhood, right? And so they may not want to put their personal phone number. That's okay. Go ahead and put the church's number. Then it, they call me. Because that's where it's being forwarded to currently. But... 
give them a way to contact. And you can also write a little message. It's just it's be creative with it. But the, but the, the fact is, when somebody sees this hanging on their door, how many people are going to grab it and throw it in the trash immediately? Well, not too many. You know, we were, we were handing out flyers for Dr. Harib's seminar. I had a lady, she picked it up off her door, and she threw it immediately in the trash. She was upset that I'd dare stick it on her door. But likely, at least, they're going to pick this up. And when you look it over there, you see that they've got access to free videos. There's how many? 1,500. That's a lot of videos that they have access, access to that will teach them. And it's all good biblical teaching. And so it gives them some great, great access. And hopefully they'll take advantage of it and or contact you. If nothing else, to tell you, please don't ever leave this on my door again. But they may contact you at some point and say, I want to learn more about what I've been watching. Do we know the outcome of anything that we put on somebody's door? Unless we see them put it in the trash. But if it goes in the house, we just don't know how far it's going to go. Because if Bob Lewis can put a track in a bottle and throw it out, and the guy comes back wanting to be baptized when they make another trip, can this work? Well, it's been proven to work. So, yes, it can work. And so I want to encourage you. We've got plenty of these. will be available in the foyer for you to pick up as many as you want to get distributed. And as we go through the next few day, few weeks, if they're still back there, we'll encourage you to pick them up and just to remind you to do so. Now, here's good news. How many of you have a Roku uh, stick, Roku player at your house, Roku TV? Okay, if, you're, if you do have that, there is a World Video Bible School app. You can download a Roku app. And if you have uh, Amazon Fire, anybody have an Amazon Fire tablet, Amazon tablet, Amazon, Amazon Fire TV, Amazon Fire Stick, you can download the app from them. And it is awesome. I looked it over today, and it is, it's, it's the same list of videos that you have right there where they can show on the TV. And so... The good part is if people get this and they, they go to, to the website, it's also going to tell them about the app. And so that makes it easier for them to put on the TV. Also, good news about this is that these videos are available on YouTube. So there's all sorts of access that we have to, to some good biblical teaching. And these videos are well, well done. And so I want to challenge you over the next week to take the time to watch some of those videos. And then next week, I'll ask you what you thought of them. So Janet's going to race home and start tonight, right, Janet? No, probably not. Okay, she's honest. But they are available, and it's a good tool. But tonight, we want to dive into the second tool, and that is the Lesson 2 booklet. It's on a DVD tonight. And I, I mentioned to the Howertons that, that we're, we're not doing a lot of live tonight, but... We're all alive, I guess. But we're going to be looking at Rob Whitaker's demonstration of a Bible study with two actual individuals. And he's sitting there with his wife, who's a silent partner, who's not so silent sometimes because she does what? Reads. And that's important. So, Luther, if you're ready to go, we'll get started with that. Ken and Marissa, it is so good to have you guys back. And I know we've had about a week to kind of think about the things that we've studied together. And we felt really good when we walked away from that study uh, last week. Uh, I, I believe you guys both, you got it. You understood that, hey, we need to go to the Bible. We've got to go back to the Bible if we're going to have the truth. And, and we, we noticed that in the Bible, the truth is something we can know. And that the truth started with Father. 
all truth and he has it all and he he has ensured that we would have it too and so he gives it to his son who comes to this world and teaches all the truth and then he he through the holy spirit inspires inspires the apostles so they can write down all the truth and put it in the bible and that we have the bible today and we look into the bible and notice there are two sections there's an old testament and a new testament and we notice that that we're under the new testament today we're under one law and that old testament was done to get us to the new testament to get us to jesus and now that we have jesus we have all the truth once that foundation has been laid we're ready to move forward we're ready to talk about the church and we're going to look at the organization of the church the worship of the church the name of the church everyone who does this study really enjoys it it's very informative and so um, you'll notice we've got a uh, lesson two back to the bible we're going to go ahead and start um if you want to open the can i ask you a question before we start Rob? absolutely absolutely yeah, i just i really would just want to tell you you know i i'm here because i want to learn but i i was saved when i was young um and you know the whole time i was growing up i've been taught that once i'm saved i'm always saved i'm glad sure. to come back because i was gone for a while i'm glad to be back trying to get back into a, a church with my sure. family and my friends but i'm already saved i don't see i don't see how that changes things can you give me any idea on that sure ken and can you tell me a little bit about your salvation i mean you said you were saved can you tell me a little bit about it sure when i was um uh, I guess when we were 16 um, in Virginia Beach, uh, mm -hmm. we were going to a church there, and I want to say Baptist, please don't quote me on that, but I was young and it wasn't my priority at the time, but I believed in Jesus, I believed in God, and um, I was baptized there. Sure. And um, I was always taught after that, and even before that, that once I was saved, that I was always saved. Right. right. That, it, that's the case, right? Well, you know, I'm, I, I, I always appreciate people sharing these personal experiences. And I bet, Marissa, you have an experience, too, you could share with us. And, you know, I think it's important that we, we reflect upon you know, our salvation. And, 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 you know, if something's important to us, we're going to want to tell other people about it. So I'm glad to listen and, 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 and have you share that with us. It tells me you're sincere. It tells me that you, I know that you love the Lord. You want to do what's right. And... Uh, as we go through this study, I think you're going to be able to take your experiences and then look into the Word of God, and you can compare them. I mean, you know, I'm not the judge. It's not up to us to determine, you know, what you did, if it was right or wrong. It's, it's really, you know, what does the Bible say? So, so what we want to do is just, you know, walk through the study. Let's keep going through the study. And as we're learning, just compare the things that you understand with what the Bible says. Okay. And uh, is that fair for, for all of us? Okay. Absolutely. Well, very good. You. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Let's go. Let's go to book two, and we'll open up uh, the lessons, and uh, we're going to start um, once again, just opening the Bible passage and, and reading it. And I'll go ahead and start again. We're going to go to the book of Matthew. You guys are probably um, um, a little bit uh, stronger in finding p passages, but again, you're in the New Testament: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're going to go to the first gospel account, and uh, Matthew chapter 16. Verse 18, a passage that you may have um, heard several times um, in the past, but maybe it's new. So let's look at it together. Matthew 16 and verse 18. And here Jesus says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The question is, who built the church? So who's speaking here? Jesus. Jesus. So, so who built the church? Jesus, Jesus. Jesus built the church. So see, we, we'd write down Jesus. So he built the church. Okay? So if Jesus built the church, to whom does the church belong? If you build something, Marissa, if you went out and built something, who would it belong to? Uh, it would belong to me unless yeah. I gave it to somebody. Exactly, exactly right. So Jesus built the church, so who does the church belong to? Jesus. Jesus. It belongs to Jesus, right. So it's a very straightforward question and answer. So... And this is another very straightforward question. It said, did Jesus build churches in the plural or the church in the singular? In other words, is the word plural or singular? He says, I will build my what? He said church, but is that not a trick question? I know he built one church, but he did build different buildings elsewhere. Right? Sure. Is sure. that the plan? That's a good, that's a good observation. And, and one thing we want to do is make sure we distinguish between a building. You know, there are a lot of buildings, but the building is not the church the church are the people that are inside the church and, and we're going to learn more about that as we go through the lesson 
And um, we're going to learn a difference in a congregation of the church, you know, different congregations. There might be uh, several congregations within a city and different congregations of the church. And but the main point we want to make in this question is, did Jesus come to build his church, the one church, or did he come to build lots of churches and you just pick the one you want? So the question is, did Jesus church. build churches plural or church singular? And it is singular. singular. So let's put that down. All right. All right, so let's go to Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, and uh, we're going to go to your right, so you're in the book of Matthew, go Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians. So we're in Ephesians, we're in chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 20 through 23, and um, Ken, if you'll read that passage as we, we look at it there, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. All right. Are you there? All right. Yeah. All right. Sorry for that. Uh, 20. Which, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, uh, far above all principalities and power and might and dom dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. All right. And so um, let's look at our question together, uh, Ken. It says, is Jesus the head over all things to the church? Is he the head over all things to the church? I'd say from that passage, yeah. Okay. And Absolutely. Since all our answers come right from the passage, that's an easy one to answer. And then uh, Marissa, in verse 23, the church is also called his what? Which is his? Body. His body. The church is his body. It's let me use an illustration uh, uh, to, to help us uh, understand the significance of this passage. And when we were growing up, we all probably watched cartoons and, and or maybe we've seen you know, children play with some type of figure. And uh, have you ever seen children watch or play with a figure that had two or three heads, multiple heads, and one body? If your child or if a child saw something like that walking down the road, no doubt he would run, he would scream, and he would say, Daddy, Mommy, I have just seen a monster. Because that's what it is. When you find something that has multiple heads in one body, that's, that's a monster. If your child goes outside and sees something with several bodies, several arms, several legs, and one head, your child would run screaming and say, Mommy, Daddy, I just seen a monster. I want you to think about this religiously. When in the religious world, when we have more than one head, we have made a monster out of religion. In the religious world, when we have more than one body and one head, we've made a monster out of religion. So I want you to think about the visual picture of what he's saying. There's the head that's Christ and the body that's the church. Aesthetically, that's a pleasing sight. It's what we look like. We've got a head. We've got a body. So what he's doing is just making a comparison that all of us can understand. It, it works in the real world. So let's go to Ephesians 4 and 4, chapter 4, verse 4, and we'll, we'll continue the, the, to build the case of the church. And uh, Marissa, would you read chapter 4 and verse 4? There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Okay. So there is, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. Now, the question says, is there only one hope? What does, what does the verse say? Yeah. Yes. One if one means one, there's one hope, okay? Now, notice also, is there one Holy Spirit, one spirit? Yeah. Yes, okay. And then, uh, uh, Marissa, does it say there is one body? Does it say there's one body? Which is, yeah. we learned the church. So the Bible teaches us there is one church, and so there's one body and uh, one spirit. So let's go to John 17, 20 through 21. Go back to your left, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You're going to go back to your left. You're going to run into Acts, and then you're going to go back to John. And uh, John 17 is a passage that is uh, very heartfelt because it's, it's the prayer of Jesus. It is, it is the Lord's prayer. It's not the model of prayer that's spoken of in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is the Lord's prayer where he's pouring out his heart to his Father. He's beseeching them. He is, he is giving his, his heart uh, to the Father. He's begging and pleading on 
behalf of his disciples. And let's notice what he says, verses 20 through 21. Nicole, would you read that? Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent to me. Okay. Would you guys do something, and you may not want to write in your Bibles, I write in my Bibles, but just make a notation here. Look at how many times Jesus uses the word one. In verse 21, that they may be one. Notice this, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one. And, and so, and it's used, in fact, in verse 22, if you just go on, that they may be one, even as we are one. So this teaching of the oneness of the church is, is a teaching of Jesus. And so the question says, uh, Ken, if you want to answer it, or Marissa, did Jesus pray that his followers all be one? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Do you believe that it helps bring people to Christ when churches aren't one, when, they're, when, they're, when there's multiple churches and everybody teaches something different? Does that help people come to know Jesus? Yeah, absolutely. Not at all. Doesn't. In fact, he says... One of the reasons he wants us to be one is so that we will believe. And so the unity is, is helpful. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. And go to your right. You're going to see Acts. And uh, then we're going to see Romans and 1 Corinthians. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. All right. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul here uh, writing to the church at Corinth says... Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now look at the question. Is religious division condemned? Well, he's begging them not to be divided. He doesn't want them to be divided, so yes, it would be condemned. So let's put that down. And the second question is this, uh, since religious division is condemned and since Jesus prayed that all his followers be one, must we strive to be one religiously? Is that what God wants for us to be one? I believe so. I would say you're right. I mean, that's what he wants. So there's a clear teaching here about the, the unity that he wants us to have as his believers. Our last scripture in this section is Colossians 1.18. Go to your right, Ken and Marissa. Just a few pages. You're going to go to 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians. And then you'll see Philippians and Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. And you're going to look for verse 18. Colossians 1 and verse 18. And once again, Paul, speaking to another congregation about the church, is going to uh, uh, conclude our, our lesson, at least at this point, with these words. Go ahead. Uh, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Preeminence. That word preeminence, um, I'm not sure, Marissa, what version or what word your version uses, but it means first place. Supremacy. Supremacy is what it means. So let's look at our question, Ken. Since Jesus is the head of the church and the body, should we go to anyone other than Jesus and the inspired writers of the New Testament to learn the organization the worship, and the name of the church. Should we go to anybody else? Nope. Absolutely not. So no, we shouldn't. And that's an outline of our study. We're going to go to the Bible and learn about how should the church be organized, how should the church worship, and, and what should the church be called? What name should we use? So we've, we've established the, the case that Jesus is the head of the church. He's built one church. He is has all preeminent supremacy. So now we're just going to ask three simple questions. First, what is the organization of the church? How does the church look? To get that answer, let's go to Matthew 15, 13. So go to your right, and you're going to see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So go to your, your, le your left, excuse me, your left. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 13. All right. All right. All right. I think Marissa, you're next, I believe. Is that right? He replied, Every plant that my Heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Okay. 
So, Marissa, if a church is not built in accordance with the Word of God, will it be rooted up? He pulled yes. the roots up. Yes, he will. So, it's important that we make sure the church is planted and, and, and by, by the Lord. And if it's not, he's going to root it up. Um, Acts 14, 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. So, and we will go to the right this time. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. So here's uh, the Apostle Paul coming back from a mission trip. He's speaking about the churches, that uh, um, congregations that he has established. And notice what he says here, verse 23, Nicole. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Question. Uh, Ken, uh, did these inspired men ordain elders in every church? Is that what they did? Yes. Yes, they did. So we'll put down yes. Okay. Next question. Are we right if we do as they did in ordaining a plurality of elders in every congregation? If we do what they did, would that be the right thing? Mm, yeah. yeah. Well, if we want to become who they were, then we need to do what they did. And so it would be right. Let's look at our third question. Uh, and uh, Marissa, could we be wrong if we did not organize the church the way those inspired men of God did? Could that be wrong if we didn't do what they did? I don't know if it would be wrong. I mean, okay. isn't there just like a different way of doing things, you okay. know, in so each church? That, that, I think if we reflect upon what we learned in our last lesson, and you remember that we, we were talking about Bible authority, and we laid the foundation that we need to have a, a Bible verse, we need to have... Uh, permission from God. We need to have a, bl a blueprint, if you will. You know, what does God want? And so the question is basically saying, if we don't do what God told us to do, if we don't do what they did, and we know they were inspired, remember they had all the truth. If we don't do it like they did it, could that be wrong? Yes. Okay, that, then that, that's what we put down. Yes, it could be wrong. So, very good. And yes, there are different ways people can do things, and what we're trying to establish is how did they do it? Because we know what they did is right. We know what they did is right. So let's go to chapter 20. We're in, still in the book of Acts. And, um, and uh, we're going to ver read verse 17 first. And verse 17 is a, a verse of context. It's going to tell us to whom is the speaking uh, being done. So here it is, verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Now, the key there is Paul, and Paul's calling for the elders, and he, he's at Miletus, and he's asking them to come because he wants to talk to them. So all the verses after verse 17 are, is a discussion he has with these elders. One of the things he says to the elders is in verse 28. So let's go to verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So are the elders to be the overseers of the church? Is that their job, to oversee the church or to shepherd the church? Is that their job? Is that what the Bible yeah, says? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely it is. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about elders uh, in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. So Titus is after 1st, 2nd Timothy's to your right. You're going to go to Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, the Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, then Titus. So Titus, it's easy to miss. So if you're at Timothy, go to, from Timothy, go to Titus. All right, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, and Paul is going to give some instructions to this church. It's on the island of Crete, how to organize themselves, all right? Go ahead, Ken. Okay. Uh, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Um, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. All right, and so let's look at uh, a couple questions from these verses. Number one, when Paul told Titus to set things in order, did he tell him to ordain elders? Is that, is that one of the things that they needed? Absolutely. Yeah, they, they were lacking that. Yep. 
absolutely. So they were lacking. The church was incomplete. So God wants the church to have elders. Look at question two. When we do what Titus did in organizing the church, are we doing the will of God? Sure, that again goes back to the principle of doing what the Bible says. Number three, does the term elder, bishop, overseer refer to the same office? I want you to look in your Bible, and let's notice, in verse number 5, it says, ordain elders. In verse 7, it says, for a bishop. Now, let's, let's, uh, let's use an earthly example to understand why different terms are used. Uh, Ken, um, I understand you're a father. I understand you're also a husband. And uh, the term father and husband, does that refer to a different individual? are the same person. Same person. But it describes different things that you do. So you may someday be a grandfather, but you're still kin. So we have to understand that we may have a lot of different titles in our life, but they may refer to the same person, but the title may in, it, you know, indicate something different that we do. So when you look into the Bible and you find the same office referred to as an elder, the word elder refers to their age, their older people. Then we have the word bishop, who describes how they oversee something. And they may be called a shepherd in another passage, or they may be described uh, as one who's ruling in another, representing their authority, all referring to the same office. And so it just describes something different that they do. So let's again look at the question. Do the terms elder, bishop, and overseer refer to the same office? Yeah, yeah, it does. And again, indicated right in the text in verse 5 and verse 7. So, let's go to page 4. And we're going to go to 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. And Marissa, just for the purpose of, of clarity, I'm going to read this passage because I want to comment on it. And I'll come right back to you after we do that. It's a pretty lengthy reading. It's seven verses. These are qualifications that Paul is giving for a, for a person to be an elder in the church, you know, can anybody be an elder? Well, let's find out. So beginning in verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I need it. Okay, go ahead. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. Not given to wine, not a striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For for man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Three questions. Question number one. Must an elder be married? Well, if we go to verse number two, and if you need to review, look at that verse. Again, must an elder be married, Marissa? Yeah. Yes, it, it says. says. Be a husband, so... Yes, the husband of one wife. So yes, he must be ma must be married. All right. So number two, uh, Ken, must an elder have children? Yes. Yes, yes. he must oh, have yes. children. So we are uh, qualifying the person who is in this office. Number three, Ken or Marissa, may a recent convert, a novice, serve as an elder? Would they qualify? Uh, no. No, and so. Again, that's very clear. Lest he be lifted up with pride, the Bible says, and fall into the condemnation of the devil. So there are qualifications. So not everyone can serve as an elder. They have to qualify to serve in that position. All right. Look at verses 8 through 12. And I'm going to read these two. These are qualifications for another church office, a different office. And so I'm going to read these, and we'll look at uh, the, the uh, question. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, and not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, and faithful in all things. 
Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house well. Now, you'll notice here that we're talking about a different office, different qualification. So what church official is under discussion here? Who are we talking about here in verse 8? They're called what? Deacons. Deacons. So let's write that down. Deacons. They're called deacons. All right. And uh, Marissa, is it God's plan that there be qualified elders and deacons in every church? Is that what God wants? I think so. Yes. It's, it's what it says. And so that is exactly what God wants. And, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. So let's go to Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Marissa, if you'll read that. We're going to see. I have one gonna, quick thing sure, about this. I just noticed. And I don't know. Right there, it's kind of off topic, but it says for the um, for the uh, the overseers, mm -hmm. for the bishop, um, not given to drunkenness. Okay. And then for the deacons, it's not indulging in much wine. Okay. What's the difference between those two? You know, that is a great question, and and you know as we as we're reading through the Bible, you're going to have um, questions about some of the things that you're reading, and. And so we want to answer those questions. So here's what I want you to do. Take your booklet, if you will. All right, let's go back to the back, and there's a white piece of paper on the back page. And Ken, if you want to do this as well, you're more than welcome to. But this is Marissa's question. Here's what I want us to do, Marissa. I want us to write down the question because I want to answer it, but we also don't want to get off course in the study. And so a topic like, you know, what does the Bible say about, you know, beverage alcohol, drinking socially wine as it relates to you know not giving to much wine and not giving to wine is an important topic so let's write that down write that question so go ahead and write down a question on first timothy so i'm going to write first timothy three and i'm going to write down verse eight and then i'll also write down verse number three and uh, the word wine and much wine and we'll get back to that if that's okay with you because it may take a little time as we go through different passages and, and what the Bible says about this topic, but it is important. But we want to get get to, and we want to get to it. So let's go back to where we were. All right. Excellent question. Let's go to Philippians chapter one verse one. So we're in Timothy. Go to your left, and you're going to run into Thessalonians and Philippians. And Philippians one one really illustrates the totality of what we just studied. Because in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Ken, where are you at there? You're in, almost there. Yep. All right. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, you're going to have here an example of a fully organized church. So, Marissa, I may stop you as you read, okay? But go ahead and start. Paul and Timothy. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Those, those, we could say those are the preachers. We could say those are your preachers right there, uh, missionaries. Go ahead. Servants of Christ Jesus. Okay. Okay, stop right there. The saints, okay, the saints, the Christians. That's another word for the Christians. Anyone who's a Christian is a saint. So you have a church, and that church has some missionaries, some preachers there. Then all the Christians are there. And keep reading. The saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. There you have the overseers, or the bishops, shepherds, elders, whatever term we want to use, and the deacons. You had a fully organized church. That's how the church looked in the first century. And that's what we want the church to look like today. We want the church today to look just like this. And so the question is, the church at Philippi was organized with blank and blank. And so we would have bishops and deacons or overseers and deacons. So let's write that in. That's, a, that's what we're trying to do today. And if we do what they did, we'll be who they were. And that's exciting to know that we can do that. With all the religions out here, we can just go back to the Bible. So simple. And we can be who they were. Let's look at our next uh, section. We looked at the organization. And previously, when the, when the gentleman brought up, once saved, always saved, how did you deal with that? 
Should he stop and go into a full study of that question? What, what did he indicate? See what the Bible said. And pointed out that that question will be answered in what? As they go through the Bible study. And for this question, he, he had them write it down. That shows, one, a respect for them and the question, doesn't it? And why didn't he want to just go ahead and dive into answering that question and do a study on uh, wines of the Bible? It wasn't the focus. And what would happen if he did? He'd lose the focus, he'd get sidetracked, and possibly miss the opportunity to keep on the pathway that he's on because these scriptures are selected to accomplish what purpose? First booklet was to establish the authority of the church, distinguish what? Between the old law and the new law, and establish the fact that we're under the new covenant. And then this lesson is dealing with the organization of the church. And so he wants them to be educated regarding very essential doctrines that would equip them to understand the church in relationship to denominations. And so he's answering questions as they go along from the Bible that will give them some very important answers he wants them to have. And, and by not spending yet time on those questions specifically, he doesn't allow himself to be sidetracked, which is very important in a Bible study because... People will have questions, and it's not that those questions aren't important, but they can be questions that very easily sidetrack you. How many of you found yourself getting sidetracked just in talking to somebody or teaching a Bible class? Your kids will have beautiful questions. Can God make a rock bigger than he can lift? How are you going to answer that one? Can you say just a good question? There you go, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But as you can see, he want, very much wants them on track. Appreciate your attention tonight. I hope you enjoyed the study. It's very good, and it's a study for anybody. Uh, basic Bible doctrines, and particularly when you're teaching somebody the gospel. And is this an offensive study? Did he cause offense for anyone? No, he handled it very well, and it kept them on track, and kept them moving, which is very important. Any questions or comments? It would be time to go into our devotional. All right. If you would like more of these gift cards, they'll be up here for now, but we will put those in the for you.
Jim King's aunt Minnie May Col Colin uh, passed away today. Uh, she was, well, I don't know if it's today or not. She was 97 years old. So keep Jim King's uh, family in our prayers. Uh, also, Ruth McMaster's brother and sister-in-law are, are fighting COVID, and, and uh, uh, he was on the ventilator, and, but he's still in the hospital, but they've taken him off the ventilator. He's having some problems with a uh, blood clot, and uh, there may be some surgery involved in that. Um, but this is Glenn and Debbie, and Debbie is improving. She's at home. Uh, I'd like to mention the holiday party sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. And um, Gina Tracy, as you've seen, she's not here tonight. Uh, home with a stomach, stomach bug. I'd like to mention our baptisms this last Sunday. Austin Dalen, Joe Hardy, Jacob Short, and Craig King. They're we have three more scheduled for this coming Sunday. Um, like to mention also on the 27th that there will be a uh, no 21st. I'm sorry, uh, this coming up, this coming Sunday, uh, men's business meeting at 4:30 in the afternoon. Um, also. Don't forget to buy your turkeys and get them to Ron. Turkeys, hams, chickens, whatever. Get them to Ron um, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, which is this coming Tuesday. Mm. I think that's all, all I have at this, this time. Let's bow our heads with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be able to uh, meet here this evening and, and to learn of your word and and how to help others to to uh, understand and and to be able to come to the word as well we pray father that as we enter our devotional period that we, our minds will be focused and and uh, uh, ready and, and willing to glean uh, the things that will be uh, brought out in christ's name Appreciate our announcers. They get stuff thrown at them, and Haley's back there trying to get everything written down, and then come up here and speak distinctly like you did is, is very good. Appreciate that, Haley. The battle belongs to the Lord. And if I falter on this, then somebody pick it up for me, if you would, please. In heaven, the armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. The weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Good evening great time to be together in the middle of the week kind of recharge our batteries to make it on to Sunday in Matthew chapter 7 in verses 28 and 29 as Jesus finished what we call the Sermon on the Mount we see the reaction of the people 
And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes would take a passage of scripture and then they would explain or tell you what the different rabbis said about this particular passage. Jesus just told them what it was. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Many times, you know, he goes back and he says, you know, from the beginning or this wasn't the way it was, you know, years back. And explain to them what the passages truly meant. And indeed, as we read his words, we can be astonished. Because he speaks to us in an authoritative way but in a way that expresses also the love of our Heavenly Father to us. He makes it with the desire that we would all be his brethren. What a wonderful thing that we can do by being obedient to the plan of salvation we enter into the family of God. Jesus is our elder brother. It's wonderful to be in that family. And tonight, if you're here and you realize maybe something that you've heard said in Bible classes or reading on your own, you know, it has astonished you. But it makes you think of what you need to do to be right with God. To stand in his presence. And the only way that we will be able to do that is if we're obedient in this life. So tonight, if you need to respond to his invitation, we pray that you would come as we stand and as we sing and make your request known. Through the deep veil, Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah. I am rejoicing, taking his praises, Jesus is mine. Let's lower that a little bit. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking. Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praise. Jesus is mine. Will you bow with me? Our most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day you've given us, Father, this middle of the week, Father, that we can come together here to study another portion of your word, Father. We thank you for that, Father, and we thank you for your son that came to this earth, Father. He died so cruelly on that cross, Father, for our sins. Pray, Father, that you would go with us through the rest of this week, Father, and pray that you would keep us safe and see us back at the next appointed time, Father. And this we pray in your Son's most holy name. Amen. <laughs>